Yeah. Uh, hi guys. Uh, today uh, our speaker is Professor Jeff Morgan from University of Cape Town. Uh, he's going to speak about a 4D wave of dualities. Uh, um, this is, uh, I think, 86th QSTM seminar in the series. And I'm very hopeful uh, that we can learn a lot of things from Jeff's talk. And thank you, Jeff, for agreeing to give this talk. And um, uh, you can start. Thanks very much, Santa. Thank you for the for the invitation as well. Um, I've tried to keep the talk uh, fairly pedagogical. Um, I know at least Nitin in the audience will have heard it before, or at least parts of it before. Um, <clears throat> so I've I've tried to keep the talk at at, at the at a level, um, let's say for for graduate students. Um, so please feel free to stop me and, and ask any questions. Um, if I'm going too fast or too slow, let me know and I'll, I'll adjust the pace as well. So, so I want to talk today about, um, about some work that we just did um, with uh, Horatio Anastasi, my long-term um, collaborator. Um, and it's based on essentially three papers, but it goes back a little, a little ways away from this as well. Um, but, but largely the notation and the, and the story that I want to tell um, is... Um, is related to the three papers that you see um, below you, um, starting in in in, in uh, 2016, and then um, we had some other work in 2018, building on that, and then um, uh, some work of March this year, um, in which we showed to how to extend this story um, to four dimensions. Okay, <clears throat> so um, the story starts off with the observation essentially that dualities are, are really everywhere. They're ubiquitous. They, they show up in, in many different aspects of um, physics. And in, in most cases, um, we really welcome the play in, in, in a system that we're studying. And, and this is because they, they help simplify the physics quite significantly. Um, some famous examples that you may have heard about already um, start with probably one of the first examples of a, of a duality that one would encounter, and that's the electric magnetic duality. And this is really the statement that the Maxwell equations, let's say in a vacuum, there's an equivalent story for um, what happens when you have source terms in the Maxwell equations. But let's just talk about the Maxwell equations in vacuum. These are four equations which have some very straightforward physical content that in a vacuum with no electric sources, there are no electric sources, there's no magnetic monopoles, and changing magnetic fields produce electric fields, and similarly changing electric fields produce uh, magnetic fields. Um, well, the first thing that you would notice, even as a first year student, is that these equations are invariant if you exchange the electric fields and magnetic fields with the magnetic field and minus the electric field. So you send everywhere you see an E, you replace it with a B, everywhere you see a B, you replace it with a minus E. Of course, you know, this can be formulated in a, in a covariant way as well. And this becomes a statement that differential geometers know as Hodge duality in four dimensions. Um, and at this level, it seems like a rather prosaic observation. Right, you know, you could certainly make this if you were a first year student and encountering these equations, you could look at it and, and see that this would be true. But this is actually a fairly deep statement. In fact, this is this statement translates um, with some work into what we string theorists would call um, S duality. Um, and in fact, it was the seed for um, Kapustin and Witten's observation um, uh, about uh, of the formulation of an understanding of the geometric Langlands conjecture, for example. And this is the cutting edge of, of mathematical physics, if you want. Um, and it all starts with this very simple observation that the Maxwell equations are invariant under this exchange of electric and magnetic fields. Probably the example of duality that we, um, that we tend to, um, certainly those of us that are working in quantum gravity and string theory that we tend to um, pounce on the most is what we would call 
uh, gauge gravity duality. This is the statement that um, gauge theory, theory of matter, is quite intimately re related to theories of gravity. And there are many known examples of this, the most famous of which is Maldacena's ADS-DFT correspondence, um, which is basically the statement that quantum gravity in a five-dimensional anti sitter space is dual in a very precise sense to um, a theory of matter, yang Mills theory in particular, living on the boundary of that ADS-5 space. More recent examples of this gauge gravity duality um, include, and I just put down two here, um, but there are, there are several known um, examples, but here's another one. And this is the so-called uh, klebanov polyakov duality. And this is the duality that was identified by Klebanov and Polyakov that said that um, a uh, theory of facility of gravity in, in five dimensions is dual to the ON sigma model um, living on the boundary of that uh, space. Um, <clears throat> more generally, and more, I guess, you know, down to earth, is, is what you would call um, T duality. T duality, or as I put it in brackets here, target space duality, is a map between nonlinear sigma models. So, for example, if I have a nonlinear sigma model that's characterized by some base manifold X, I'm sorry, some target space X, um, some um, metric G um, and a, and a two-form um, uh, field B, um, there's a map that takes this nonlinear sigma model um, to another nonlinear sigma model, um, X tilde, G tilde, and B tilde. Um, and this is a very precise map, and you can define it for two ECFTs, for example. Um, um, and in fact, the realization that the world sheet of the string, which is a two-dimensional object, um, or the object in one plus one dimensions, is precisely such a nonlinear sigma model, is what led to the realization that, um, that uh, string theory exhibits such T duality, um, which of course led to enormous development of the field back in the 1990s, and ultimately to the discovery of, um, of, of D brains in, in string theory. Closer to what I want to talk about today is the idea of bosonization, which is in an, an which is an old idea that goes back to the 1970s, um, already um, uh, realized by the likes of Sidney Coleman and Stanley Mandelstam um, in high energy physics, or back then I guess you would call it field theory literature, um, and simultaneously um, in the condensed matter literature by various luminaries in condensed matter. Um, and it really kind of reflected the interplay between condensed matter and, 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 and high energy back then. And since then, the fields kind of split a little bit, um, and they're starting to, to reconverge again um, in the last couple of years. And, and really what I want to be talking about today um, details this kind of reconvergence. Um, bosonization is really a map between bosonic and fermionic theories. And the most famous example of this is um, is the so-called massive Thuring model, um, Sion-Gordon um, duality. The massive Thuring model is a uh, fermionic um, uh, theory with a four Fermi contact interaction. Um, and this theory is dual, um, again, in a very precise sense, to, um, <clears throat> to a theory of bosons with a, uh, with a, uh, a cosine type, um, Self interaction. And this, you know, this duality has been known for a long time. Um, and, and we understand how to map the various objects in the spectrum of each theory to the other one. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's revealed much about not only particle physics, but also about condensed matter um, theory. So here you are giving so, one, one example of bosonization. There might be a lot of other examples. In oh, indeed, there are. There are absolutely lots of examples of bosonization. I, I just gave you the, the, the one that, you know, if you, if you search bosonization, the first kind of thing that comes up is, is um, uh, massive sign Gordon. Yes. Um, to, uh, sorry, massive um, uh, Thuring to sign Gordon. In fact, the massless Thuring model is dual to, to, um, to a free boson, to a compact boson. Um, the, free bos the free fermion is due to, is dual to, bo uh, to a, to a, a free boson, 
Um, there are examples of, uh, there's, there's one or two examples of trialities um, where you know, eight Majorana fermions are dual to eight Majorana fermions, which are dual to another eight Majorana fermions. So, the, you know, this is really a beautiful story with lots of intricate webs between um, different theories. And, and, and my talk is really about connecting the dots between these various different theories. Um, so does that answer your question? Sorry. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, so, so, so there's some, so, question. Um, so sorry. nonetheless, uh, there is bosonization concept is in the same, uh, I mean, the two theories around have the same space type dimensions? Or like it is CFT, they are- uh, No, no, one no. in, in bosonization, they have the same space time dimension. Oh, okay. okay, thanks. Yeah. So, so, so in fact, you know, ADS CFT is, is, is an example that's, that's unlike the other examples that I cited. Um, you know, in, in, in electric magnetic duality, in bosonization, in T duality, um, the theories get mapped to the same space-time dimension. ADS-CFT is a, is a different kind of duality where really the duality is holographic in the sense that you're starting from some bulk and you're mapping to, uh, and the, the, the dual theory is a reorganization of the degrees of freedom in the bulk um, to give you something on the boundary which is one dimension lower. So that's actually a, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a slightly different type of, of, of duality. Um, and in fact, it plays into the next point that I wanna make, which is that there's some common, there's some common lessons to be learned from these, from these dualities. Uh, of course, I haven't listed all the dualities. There are many, many dualities. In fact, um, I, I've kind of focused on the things that are non-supersymmetric. Once you, once you include supersymmetry, then you have cyborg duality, you have mirror symmetry, you have a whole bunch of, of different other, um, kinds of, of, of dualities, which I don't really want to go into at this point. But there are some common points that need to be mentioned here. One is that dualities typically map, specifically the dualities that I, that I talked about here, they typically map um, theories in one regime of coupling to another regime of coupling. So a strong coupling to weak coupling or weak coupling to strong coupling. Now, obviously, there's a good reason for, for why this is a useful thing to, to, to note. One is that in physics, typically we can't calculate quantities, most quantities, especially in quantum theories, exactly. So what we do is we tend to, we tend to do perturbation theory. And in perturbation theory, you need a small number. Typically the small number is a coupling constant. Um, and where the coupling, content, where the coupling is weak, you have a well-defined perturbation theory. So you can organize a perturbation series term by term, and you can you can you can convince yourself that you can discard some of these terms and keep the smallest terms, and you can calculate these terms. That's not to say that each of these terms that you calculate is easy to calculate. Certainly not. You know, we're still learning how to sum the planar diagrams in in QCD, for example, um, which is the lowest order um, in, in in the perturbative series there. Um, but nevertheless, if you don't have a small number with which to make a Taylor expansion in your perturbation series, then you're in a little bit of trouble. And that's exactly where these dualities would come in. You could take a theory that's a strong coupling where you don't have such a control parameter, and then you can map it to a theory of weak coupling where you do. And as long as the dictionary is faithful, then you know that the quantities you calculate on the one side can be mapped to quantities on the other side. And this gives you a handle on, on, on various things you can calculate. So again, you know, in the context of, of ADS-CFT, we've learned tremendous amounts using this holographic duality by mapping um, strongly coupled quantum field theories, gauge theories specifically, to weakly coupled gravity. And in gravity, the, the coupling is, of course, a Newton constant. So weakly coupled gravity means weak curvatures, small curvatures um, in, in gravity. And this has taught us enormous amounts about um, how to understand strongly coupled gauge theories and vice versa. We, we, we learn things about um, gravity in the strong coupling regime. For example, um, gravity in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the context of um, black holes and black hole information and early universe cosmology. Um, we, we, can, we can understand in greater detail than we've ever done before um, by mapping these things to um, to weakly coupled gauge theories, weakly coupled quantum field theories, and doing perturbation theory there. 
Um, there's some, you know, as an as an example that's that I, that I quite I'm quite fond of. There's there's some beautiful work by Turok and uh, Ben Craps in which they try to understand um, cosmological singularity resolution um, by mapping the problem to some uh, quantum field theory. Okay. Um, the second point to note is that many of these dualities, and again, AES-CFT is an exception to this um, statement as yet, maybe we don't understand how to do it and maybe one day we will, um, but many of these dualities can be formulated um, in a path integral language. Um, and by this I mean, um, if you start off with some master integral, um, uh, let's let's say the master integral, um, master path integral, you write as the functional integral over some set of fields phi and some set of fields psi um, as it multiplied weighted by e to the i um, times the action and the action is a functional of um, phi and psi as well. And I'm just calling phi and psi um, some general set of fields here. I don't necessarily mean that one set is boson and one set is fermion. Um, I just mean that um, in, in this case, um, they're placeholder for some bigger set of fields, okay? Then the statement is, if I integrate out the set of fields psi, then I end up, uh, I end up with a partition function for, another, for a theory, which I'll call theory A, and this is, a part, this is expressed as a functional integral um, of e to the i, let's say, s prime, and s prime is functional of phi. Um, on the other hand, if I exchange the order of integration and I integrate out psi, um, then I end up with a, another theory, um, theory B. And in this sense, I will say that um, theory A and theory B are dual to each other. Okay. Um, <clears throat> very good. Um, now I want to take a step back here and talk about um, uh, some more examples um, of, of this kind of duality. And much of what I want to say today has to do with a specific class of um, theories in three dimensions um, called Chen Simon's theory. And Chen Simon's theory is a topological theory. There are no dynamical degrees of freedom in, in Chen Simon's theory. And the topology of Chen Simon's theory really makes it a remarkably beautiful theory, leading ultimately, for example, to, to um, uh, Witten's results, the Jones polynomial and, and things like that, that led to his Fields Medal. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, this has to do with the fact that um, Chen Simon's um, theory, pure Chen Simon's theory is a topological quantum field theory. Now, um, you know, the first kind of time I, 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 I heard about these topics um, was from um, Chiraz Minwala um, in a series of lectures where he said, well, you know, Chen Simon's theory is a beautiful topological quantum field theory. Why would, you want to, why would you want to mess with it? Well, it turns out that one way you could mess with this beautiful topological theory is to couple it to matter. If you couple it to matter, then you break the, the, the topological properties of this theory. But nevertheless, over the, the, the decade that I you know, kind of heard this story from, from Shiraz, um, I've learned that, and uh, I think the point that he was trying to convey as well, is that Chern Simon's matter theory, even when you couple it to Chern Simon's theory to, to matter, um, you, you, you still have a remarkably rich, beautiful structure to this, to this theory. There are a couple of examples illustrating this remarkable, beautiful structure, um, et cetera. One example that, that comes to mind immediately is the so-called Harani bergman jafaris malesena theory, ABJM theory. ABJM theory is a Chen Simons meta theory in two plus one dimensions. Um, and this two plus one dimensional um, space time is supposed to be the boundary of a, um, of a three plus one dimensional um, bulk. And it turns out that ABJM theory is dual to the type 2a string on ADS4 cross um, CP3, CP3 being the complex projective three space, um, which gave us an, you know, this whole other um, uh, canonical example of the, the gauge gravity correspondence to play with. This, you know, this was this was all the rage back in the early 2000s. Uh, sorry, in the kind of mid 2000s. Around 2010 or so, 
Okay, so so um, primarily because this was another um, concrete example of the gauge gravity correspondence. And up to up until then, we'd had ADS five cross S five and the type two B string on ADS five cross S five, and its various limits. Um, you know, flat space, PP wave, etc. So variance on, on on one example. Well, here came along another example, and this example happened to be dual to not Yang Mills theory in three dimensions but um, a Chern Simons matter theory in, in three dimensions. In fact, two copies of a Chern Simons matter theory in two dimensions, uh, three dimensions. Very good. The second example, and much closer to what I want to talk about in this talk, is what I'm calling um, Aharoni's duality. So Ofer Aharoni, um, in studying these Chern Simons matter theories, um, characterized a number of these um, dualities. Um, and, and it turns out that there are three classes of these dualities, and I listed them here, and I'm going to call these um, Aharni's dualities. So the statement is the following. Um, if I have NF fermions um, in, uh, in all of what I'm talking about now is in two plus one dimensions. So suppose I have um, uh, a theory with NF flavors of fermions. Um, coupled to a uh, UK level minus N um, plus, so let's, let's, let's hit, so all right, so this is the level number of the, um, of the associated gauge field, um, it's minus N plus NF over 2, um, comma minus n plus nf over two. Um, and the plus sign here means that I couple these fermions to some gauge field, and this is the gauge group of that, um, of that gauge field, okay? So this theory with nf, flavor, uh, NF fermions coupled to some UK um, uh, gauge field is dual to another theory with nf scalars now coupled to an sun level k um, gauge field. Similarly, um, a theory with NF fermions um, coupled to an SUK level minus N plus NF over two gauge field is dual to another theory with NF scalars coupled to a UN K comma K um, gauge field. And then finally, NF fermions coupled to uh, a UK gauge field with that level number is dual to NF scalars coupled to a UN um, uh, level K, comma, K plus N um, gauge field. So the thing to notice here is that when I go from the left-hand side of these dualities to the right-hand side of the dualities, the rank of the gauge group, um, this quantity here, gets exchanged with the, with N. So I go from a UK, roughly level N um, gauge field to a UN level K gauge field. Okay, this is important. In the general idea of, of Chen Simon's theories, uh, this is a manifestation of something called level rank duality. And these level rank dualities um, we're going to be seeing um, a lot of in, in, in this story. Of course, it's not strictly exchange K and N in this case, as it becomes a little more complicated once you throw in matter fields, um, but that's, you know, the, the, the message is, is, is essentially there. Just a word of notation, um, what I mean by UM level K comma L is really um, SUM level K cross U1 level M times L modded out by um, ZN. Okay, so that's just some notation. It's not really important to the story. Um, what is important to the story is the structure. Fermions on the one side, bosons on the other side, UK level N on one side, UN level K on the other side. Right, so some combination of, of level rank duality together with bosonization. Okay, <clears throat> so let's look at a special case of this story. And the special case of the story I want to take is when in this Aharoni dualities, in this set of Aharoni dualities, these guys here, um, I, I take a particular set of values for um, the number of flavors, the rank of the gauge group, and the level of the gauge group. I choose them all to be one. Okay, so NF equals N equals K equals one. Well, it turns out that um, when I do that, all three of those duality sets 
boil down to two statements. The first of these two statements is that a Wilson-Fisher scalar, so this is a scalar at the Wilson-Fisher and not free field um, fixed points in the, in the renormalization group flow, uh, otherwise known as massless phi-4 theory. And this theory is dual to a fermion, a single fermion, coupled to a U1 gauge field. Okay. Um, a U1 Chern-Simons gauge field. And the second statement is that the free fermion is dual to a Wilson-Fisher scalar, again, massless phi-4 theory, coupled to a U1 Chern-Simons field. So this is quite remarkable um, because these theories have these theories have been known and studied for a long time in 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 um, both in condensed matter as well as in field theory, um, and you know now we can see that they're arising as a special case of this broader set of um, dualities that involve Chen Simon's theories with non-abelian gauge fields. Mm, yeah. Okay. So that's that's observation three. Observation four. Um, is, is one that was made in condensed matter physics. And here, um, it goes by the name of um, Sun's conjecture, and it's, after, it's named after Dam Sun, um, who, who made the observation that the two plus one dimensional boundary of a three plus one dimensional topological insulator um, can be described in two different ways. One, as a gapless Dirac fermion coupled to an external gauge field, and the second description, the second equivalent description of this story is as a composite Dirac fermion coupled to an external gauge field and some dynamical gauge field. So two gauge fields in the story, one is dynamical, this is the external gauge field, and the other one, uh, sorry, one is non-dynamical, this is the external gauge field, and the other one is a dynamical or fluctuating field, All right? Now, the, so I should take a step back, and if you don't know this, um, uh, maybe I can, I can say a few words about um, the topological insulator. So a topological insulator is a class of quantum material um, in which the bulk of the material behaves um, as, an, as, an, as an insulator, and the boundary of the material behaves as a conductor. So electrons are free to move on the boundary, but they're not free to move in the in the um, in the bulk of the material, um, <clears throat> and they're really um, remarkable class of quantum matter um, that um, we're only starting to get to grips with um, in terms of a theoretical understanding of these materials um, today. So Son's conjecture then um, is a statement about the duality between fermions. One is a Dirac gapless Dirac fermion coupled to some external field, and the other one is a composite Dirac fermion um, coupled to some external field. So the special case that I talked about is a case of a scalar or boson coupled to a fermion. And now I'm giving you another example um, of fermions that are dual to each other, two, so two fermionic theories. So more specifically, this Sun's conjecture is a statement of what's called fermionic particle vortex duality. And in equations, it is the statement that um, the massless, sorry, the gapless Dirac fermion psi coupled to an external gauge field is dual to this um, composite Dirac fermion chi coupled to um, an external gauge field capital A, which itself is coupled to uh, a dynamical gauge field um, uh, little a through some uh, df type coupling like this. I'll expand a little bit on what these mean, uh, what these things mean in a, uh, as we go on. But I want you to contrast this duality between a fermionic theory and a fermionic theory with another well known duality, um, uh, well known in 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 the condensed matter circles for sure, but also in the high energy um, uh, literature, and this is called particle vortex duality. And particle vortex duality is a statement that um, the Wilson-Fisher scalar, again, this is massless phi-4 theory coupled to an external gauge field, is dual to um, a gauged Wilson-Fisher theory. So here I, I gauge the global U1 of the phi-4 um, uh, theory um, by coupling it to some dynamical gauge field, little b. Um, and then I couple B 
um, to an external gauge field capital B. So this is what's called particle vortex theory, uh, particle vortex duality, and it is an it's a well-known um, uh, statement that goes back many, many years um, in the condensed matter literature. It has to do with um, anion condensation and things like that. Sorry, anion superconductivity um, and things like that. Um, and it's the statement that um, in this theory uh, on the right-hand side, um, this guy here is nothing but um, the abelian Higgs model. And the abelian Higgs model has certain solitonic solutions um, called vortices. And the vortices in this theory get mapped to fundamental quanta in this theory, so particles, um, and vice versa. Particles in the one theory get mapped to um, vortices in, in the other theory. And this is because in two plus one dimensions, in, or rather you know, on the plane, particles and vortices interact in the same way. Vortices um, are essentially, um, uh, they, they, they behave they behave the same way as particles do. Any questions? Yeah, so I just wanted to ask you, the gapless Dirac Fermion, what do you mean by gapless? Is it like massless? So in this case, um, it is effectively massless, um, but in general, I mean that there's no there's no gap in its spectrum. Oh, okay. 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 So this observation, specifically that you have this um, fermionic version of particle vortex um, duality was made, um, or, or rather that Sun's conjecture was equivalent to a fermionic particle vortex duality was made by Vishwanath and Metlitsky um, circa 2015, I'd say, 2014 or 2015, I can't remember the exact um, uh, date. Um, and it's what it's what spurred myself and Horatio to to start thinking about this this problem. And in trying to understand what was meant by fermionic particle vortex duality, we started to to unravel some bigger picture in this in the story. And then, and it's a it's a very amusing story, but um, it turns out that there were two other groups that were working on this at the same time. Um, that being um, David Tong and Andreas Karch um, uh, and um, uh, Nadi Seiberg and um, Edward Witten together with two Harvard condensed matter theorists, uh, Senthil and, and, um, and Chong Wang. Um, and um, we kind of all coincidentally learned that we were working on the same problem um, and agreed to, to publish our results at the same time. So this kind of led to this idea of a full three-dimensional web of dualities that connect, sorry. Since question. you have actually mentioned about Cyborg's work, so he actually pointed yes. something called fracton. So can you able to comment on that? Some fracton and its dualities, class of papers. That, that, yeah, that takes me quite far away from what I wanted to talk about here. The fractons oh. are, are specific classes of, 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 of phases of matter in, in two plus one dimension, eh, eh, sorry, in condensed matter, um, that it will take a lot longer to, to kind of unpack. Um, but I can give you some references if you want, or maybe if I, if I have sure, time, sure, I, can, sure. I can talk sure. about it at the end. I don't, I, I, you know, I, I haven't paid too much attention to, the, to, to, the, to that part of the literature. So I, I, I have not much intelligence to say about it. No, um, no but, um, Okay, so 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 you know, circa the the summer of 2016, you know, these three groups, Cyberg, Sentil, Wang, and Witten, Karch and Tong, and myself and Nastasi, um, all kind of unpacked this structure um, at the same time, leading to this three-dimensional web of um, dualities, um, which basically said that um, there are three different threads to the story. There's a boson-boson duality, there's fermion-fermion dualities, and there's um, boson-fermion dualities. And by using combinations of these dualities, I could take you between one theory and something that looks completely different. Um, so that's what we were, we were kind of um, led to um, back in 2016. And this, this led to an, you know, to an explosion of results from the summer of 2016 uh, right through to today, and as as um, Jan Santan pointed out, um, 
you know, in, in one direction, it's 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 gone to explore these new phases of matter, like uh, new exotic phases of matter, like fractons and, and topological superconductors and things. And on the other side, it's it's unpacked a lot about um, some of the fundamentals of quantum field theory that you know we were that we'd kind of taken for granted for many many years, um, but that you know needed unpacking in some sense. Um, among the results, among the notable results that I'd like to mention here, um, the first came quite soon after um, we put out our papers, um, and that was by Shamit Kachru and his collaborators, um, in which they showed that you could derive this three-dimensional duality web um, from a supersymmetric um, uh, duality known as 3D mirror symmetry. And 3D mirror symmetry maps a free chiral superfield to what is essentially n equals two supersymmetric um, QED in three dimensions. Um, and the way you get from the one to the other is you take this supersymmetric duality and you deform it by adding some determined information. And then you let the theory flow to the infrared. And where it flows to is precisely um, the three dimensional web. So the phase diagram of this um, 3D mirror symmetry gets mapped essentially to um, the 3D duality web. In another kind of direction, um, uh, Cyberg and his students and collaborators um, did, worked very hard and produced some beautiful results extending this um, three-dimensional uh, abelian duality web. So, so all the gauge fields I'm talking about today um, are, are abelian gauge fields. They involve um, the global symmetry uh, U1. Um, they managed to extend this to, to um, uh, non-abelian uh, duality web, um, which has a far richer structure as you would imagine. Um, and as I understand it, there's, you know, there's still unpacking details of this uh, non-abelian duality web and learning about things like uh, non-abelian anion, um, non-abelian anions and how they connect to, for example, um, uh, topological quantum computing, um, um, via the work of Moore and Reed. Um, and then the final um, thread I'd like to mention um, is, is, is also by uh, Karch and, and Tom uh, with David Tong's uh, former student and now postdoc, um, Carl Turner, um, who took this three-dimensional duality web and by dimensionally reducing, um, showed how to drop it to two dimensions, in which case um, it, it's the, 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 un, the structure that ends up in that case ends up connecting a whole bunch of different theories that were known to exist already and again, you know, since studied since the 1970s. Um, and, and there was a hint that these, that these theories were, were connected to each other, but nobody had really connected the dots. And Karch, Tong, and Turner um, did precisely this in 2018 and connected these dots to derive a two dimensional. Um, web of uh, dualities, and they also showed how this three-dimensional duality web descended to the two-dimensional duality web by dimensional reduction. The question I'd like to ask in this talk is, if you have a three-dimensional duality web and this three-dimensional duality web um, descends by dimensional reduction to two dimensions so that you have a two-dimensional duality web as well, um, with its own, you know, kind of really beautiful structure that has to do with things like off invariance and, and stuff like that. Is there a possibility that you could take the three-dimensional duality web and lift it to four dimensions? So is there a similar duality web of boson, boson, fermion, fermion, boson, fermion dualities in four dimensions, right? So capital D here will always refer to the space-time dimension. So I will be talking about three plus one dimensions. So that's the central question I'd like to pose um, for this talk. Okay, so now a related question is, well, why is the answer not obvious? Okay, we know that there's a three-dimensional duality web. We know that there's a two-dimensional duality web. Um, and, and, and even though, you know, mathematicians would certainly not consider these things proved, um, there is an enormous amount of circumstantial evidence to suggest that these duality webs are true. So why, why is it not obvious that it's true in, in, in four dimensions as well? Well, there are a couple of reasons, um, and uh, I'd like to 
explore um, just the reasons for why one should be skeptical first, and then why one should be hopeful second. And then I'll show you how we can actually go about constructing it. So in, in, in let's say in general, um, D plus one, little D plus one dimensions, right? So capital D space-time dimensions. Bosonization is a map between a massive Dirac fermion and a D minus two form field. Okay. And I mean this in the sense of um, differential geometry. And this D minus two form field is generally coupled to a scalar with some derivative type interactions. Right? The moral of the story is that you can actually extend bosonization, which is well defined in one plus one dimensions to little d greater than one, okay? And all that happens is that this Dirac fermion gets mapped to a form field coupled to a scalar. So for example, in four dimensions, or sorry, in, in three dimensions, um, where um, capital D is, is, is three, three-dimensional three bosonization, which I'm going to review just now, maps a massive Dirac fermion into a one-form field, and a one-form field is a typical gauge field, um, coupled to a Wilson-Fisher scale, okay? Um, in four dimensions, I would expect that a that the bosonization maps to a two-form field coupled to some scalar, okay? So that's the expectation. And what we'd like to understand is if this expectation is a good one or it's naive um, and something goes wrong. And of course, you know, not that something goes wrong, but it's a very subtle um, uh, set of points that need to be expanded on. The first one is that, you know, the bosonized theory, the theory of the scalars coupled to some, some bosonic form fields, has many nice features that we would expect such a theory to have. One is, for example, gauge invariance, in which case this form field, if this is a D minus two form field, um, so this would be a D minus two form field, I'll call it B. This guy gets mapped to, sorry, this guy, um, uh, the theory is invariant if I add to B um, the external derivative of some D minus three form field omega. Okay. So gauge invariance is there, that's fantastic. We always want our theories to be um, gauge invariant because it tells us that the, that the physics is independent of how we choose to describe it. But it also has some rather non nice properties. One such is that in whenever capital D is greater than or equal to four, the theory becomes non-local. So for example, in four dimensions, four space-time dimensions, the, um, the massive fermion gets mapped to a scalar with this kind of interactions. So this, the kinetic term for the scalar looks like phi, one over box, box being the delimbation, um, uh, acting on, on phi. And there's some, you know, couple coupling to some gauge field here. The coupling to the gauge field is perfectly fine. But this one over box interaction, this one over box interaction um, is a problem because it means that the theory is non-local. Um, and locality is another one of these properties that we'd really like our theories to, to exhibit. Okay. So, however, we're, we're, quite, we're kind of motivated by the fact that even though the theory is possibly non-local in four dimensions, maybe we can redefine, um, maybe we can redefine some things, some, some of the fields in the theory to accommodate this, and the theory is not, in, not essentially sick. So that's the hope that we're going to go on, that even though that there are these problems um, with bosonization in, in four dimensions, um, uh, the theory is very likely not sick, and we should plow on and see how far we can get. Okay, so now I want to review the three-dimensional um, 
the construction of the three-dimensional duality web, because much of these construction will go through for four dimensions um, with, some possible, um, with some possible modifications. But for the most part, the, the philosophy of what we're going to do um, is shared between the three and four dimensions. Before I start, any questions at this point? In the previous slide, you mentioned ma uh, massive direct funnels. So is the mass, the fact that, I mean, unlike the fact that in the one before you were talking about the gap, gapless fermions. So mm -hmm. in that, in the previous slide, was the fact that these fermions are most important in some sense, uh, like, uh, or is, is the, I mean, it's not really relevant. No, it is actually quite relevant. Um, and I'll tell you why. It's because, it's because, um, in implementing the bosonization, at some point you need to, you, you will find that you need to invert the vacuum polarization tensor. Um, and inverting, okay, sorry, sorry. Let, me, let, me, let me take a step back. Um, you, you need to carry out a certain path integral. And the problem is that you can't carry out this path integral exactly. So what you do is you introduce the mass as a regulator. And in fact, you go to the large mass limit and you do perturbation theory in one over M. So that's why I need the mass, um, and then I'm, and then I hope that you know once I once I uh, carry out the path integral and I and I show that the and I calculate the dual theory, I can then have a sensible m to zero limit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So I I mean I'll, I'll show you the technicalities as we go as we go on um, uh, a little bit later. Okay. So. Let me start then by reviewing the three-dimensional duality web um, and its construction. So firstly, uh, just some notation here. Um, uh, phi, I will tend to, to uh, refer to as a, uh, I'll tend to use to refer to scalars, psi for fermions. Capital A will be A mu dx mu and mu will go uh, zero, one, two. Um, and this will correspond to an external gauge field. So this is a gauge field without any dynamics, okay? So think about taking this, this two plus one dimensional planar system and putting it in an external magnetic field, for example, right? Or an external electric field. And I don't get to, I don't get to uh, consider the dynamics. This field is non-dynamical, it's static. I can just turn it up as I want to turn it down as I want. So it's a parameter in the theory. But um, my theory doesn't back react with the with that with that field. Okay, so I'm going to call this an external gauge field, and I contrast that with little a, which is a mu dx mu, which is a dynamical gauge field. Typically, this gauge field will arise from gauging some global symmetry group of the of the theory. So this guy will have dynamics, which means that I have to think about kinetic terms that I add um, for little a. Um, when I couple my, my fields to an external gauge field, that includes adding a coupling like capital A times uh, the field that I'm uh, acting on, psi or phi. And I do that by um, promoting um, uh, partial derivatives to covariant derivatives. So in this case, capital D capital a, subscript capital A is really little d minus IA. I'm suppressing indices here and, and, and in fact, in working in three dimensions, most of what I'm going to be saying, I'll um, I'll, I'll take the liberty to abuse some notation and, and write everything in terms of the language of forms. Um, um, and if you're unclear about anything, ask me, and I'm happy to, to expand on it. Then there's some some relevant actions that we're going to need. Um, so I'm going to define them here, and and you will see them here, and and. Um, as we go along, I'll just write down the actions because much of the story can be done. Uh, much of the story can be can be told without actually uh, going to the nitty gritty of, of manipulating these actions. So the first action that you will um, encounter is one for a massive scalar and the massive scalar okay, so action. Uh, interrupt, interrupting you. Uh, the covariant yeah, so the covariant derivative, you uh, you not expect the dynamical gauge field to actually enter the covariant derivative itself. If I come, if I couple the the field to a dynamical gauge field, then I'll then it'll be capital uh, D little a. Oh, okay. okay. Right. So 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 if I couple it to, I can couple it to whatever I want, right? So if I couple it to an external gauge field with no dynamics, then this is what it looks like. Um, 
this is what it looks like. If I couple it to a statistical gauge field or something that fluctuates, then it'll then I'll have a little a, and in fact I will have an extra a gauge covariant derivative with a little a involved. Um, but then I have to include some kinetic term for for the little a. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. Um, great questions. Keep them coming. I, I'm, I'm I'm very happy to answer the questions. Okay. So. Um, the scalar action is a functional of phi and uh, and A, typically, capital A, so external gauge field. Um, and this is what it would look like. It's, it's, it's standard um, kinetic term for a um, complex scalar. I'll, I'll typically mean, when I say scalar, I'll typically mean a complex or charged scalar. So mod d phi squared minus m squared uh, phi squared um, this is, of course, the mass of the of the um, of the scalar, and this is the coupling of the scalar. Um, and sometimes, when I'm talking about a Wilson-Fisher coupling, I will mean specifically the tuning of m relative to lambda, such that m goes to such that the mass term drops out, and then I have basically just the the massless phi four theory. So whenever that's the case, then this theory has two fixed points in the in the infrared. One is the free field fixed point, um, in which case lambda goes to zero and m goes to zero. So it's just a mod d phi squared. And the other one is known as the Wilson-Fisher um, fixed point in which um, the mass tunes to zero and the um, uh, quadratic term uh, drops out. Okay, so that's what I'll mean by a Wilson-Fisher scalar, a scalar and a mass uh, and a uh, free scalar. Okay. The next um, action we're going to need to talk about is the gapped fermion, um, or um, uh, sorry, the gapped fermion coupled to an external U1, and it'll take the standard form of a Dirac um, uh, action, so something like that. Um, whenever I talk about S fermion, um, this is what I will uh, this is what I will mean. M here is, is, is as usual the mass of the fermion. The next action that's going to play a very important role in the story is the Chern-Simons action. And the Chern-Simons action, which I'll denote by SCS of A, um, is proportional to the integral of A wedge dA. So technically what I mean here is um, A wedge dA or epsilon mu nu lambda A mu d nu a lambda. But, uh, okay. Why you haven't written the additional term like two third a cube? <laughs> because I'm, I'm thinking about um, uh, abelian gauge fields. Okay. If I had a non-abelian gauge field, then I'll have to have, an, then I'll have a two thirds a cubed term. Okay, okay. Okay, but everything that I'm going to be talking about um, has to do with um, abelian uh, gauge fields. Okay. And the proportionality constant that um, that enters the story is this here, and this is called the Chern-Simons level, right? And for reasons that I want my theory to be gauge invariant, the Chern-Simons level number has to be an integer. This is a this is a big deal, okay? That the Chern-Simons level number is an integer, and if you ask uh, Nadi Seidberg at any point, um, he will tell you that, you know. The, the, the precise number that this k has to be is what led him to think about this, this story and, and effectively what led to, to the three-dimensional um, duality web is the fact that what high energy physicists call k and what uh, for the duality and what condensed matter physicists call k differ by a factor of two. Okay, so factors of two are important for any students in the audience. Um, this, the, the, um, the, the last type of action that I'm going to need here is what's called a BF coupling. So instead of having an ADA term, I have an ADB term, um, where A and B are both abelian um, uh, fields. So this guy here. Um, and um, so at level uh, one, this is one over two pi, um, ADB, uh, sorry, at level two. Um, and you can show that, so we're going to take this to be the definition of the um, of the BF coupling, 
Um, and you can show by integrating by parts that SBF of AB is the same as FBF of uh, BA up to some boundary term that comes from the integration by parts. Okay, there, there, uh, this is an easy calculation to do. Uh, there are two minus signs that come, one with the integration by parts and the other one with um, the anti-commutivity of, um, of the wedge product. Okay, very good. So those are all the, those are all the, um, the um, actions that are going to play a role in this story. So I had a question regarding this K. So this K is, sure. also, uh, K is also related to this etuft coupling, this... Uh, uh, like n by k is lambda actually. So in two plus in in in, in ABGM theory, for example. It is ABGM theory. So like, but yeah. in, here is there is some kind of connection? No, it's exa it's the same. It's it's a, it's the same level number. It's not uh, you know in in, in a Okay, so I'm not going to be taking any tough limit here because um, I, I'm going to be working with the billion um, gauge field, um, right? So, so there's there's no tough um, limit being taken here. But if I was dealing with a non-abelian gauge field, um, where the rank of the gauge group was let's say n, and this n became a parameter in my theory, then sure, n over k could certainly play the role of uh, uh, of a tough coupling, and I could take n to infinity and k to infinity and keep the ratio of them fixed as I want, um, etc. So, so yes, absolutely correct observation, um, but not going to play a role in what I'm going to say. Okay. Okay. So the next, um, I have two more points to make on, on this slide and they're both important points. One is that in condensed matter, a long time ago, it was realized that if you take an electron and you puncture this electron with, um, with a, a quantum of flux, so take the electron, stick it in a, in a magnetic field, for example. Um, and sorry, my computer is about to go flat. So let me just plug that in. If you take the, the electron and you attach to it some, some quantum of flux, then you can transmute the electron, which is a fermion, into a boson. And vice versa, if you take a boson, puncture it with with some uh, with some uh, quantum of, of, of magnetic flux, you will transmute this into a fermion. So, so that is the collective excitation of a fermion plus a flux behaves like a boson and vice versa. This is called flux attachment. In a relativistic theory, the way you implement flux attachment is precisely by adding a Chern-Simons term to the to the action. So whenever you add a Chern-Simons term to the action um, in a relativistic theory, effectively what you're doing is attaching a flux to the, to the quanta of your system. And you should expect that the collective behavior of the, of the quantum plus the, the quantum of flux behaves um, in a transmuted way. So if you've got a fermion, add a flux to it, um, you'll get a boson. If you've got a boson, add a flux to it, it behaves like a fermion, okay? And then finally, I want to mention that the dualities that I'm going to be talking about are what we call infrared dualities. So these are dualities that hold at high energies. You'll notice that I haven't mentioned um, anywhere um, a Maxwell um, action. Certainly you should expect to see something like a F squared, uh, an integral over F squared um, term in, this, in, in, in any story involving gauge field. So why don't I mention this? Well, that's because an integral of F squared typically comes with a coupling constant like one over E squared. And these dualities that I'm gonna be talking about are taking place at low energies. So in the infrared of the theory. And in the infrared of the theory, um, E goes to infinity, which means that any of these Maxwell type um, uh, kinetic terms are going to drop out, okay? So finally, I'm going to say that if I have two theories, what I mean by an infrared duality is that if I have two theories, <clears throat> let's say theory A and theory B, I will call theory A and theory B dual to each other if their partition functions agree. So if ZA and ZB are equal, then I will say that these two theories are infrared dual, okay? So this is what I'm gonna mean by um, an IR duality. It must in, be noted that this yeah. point two, this I factor shouldn't be inside the bracket I deep slash. I'm sorry, say again. 
this fermion uh, the gauge fermion interacting uh, action that you have written mm. in three dimension mm -hmm. the i factor shouldn't be written yep. in the bracket i d slash plus m why this i have taken outside i just Oh, because I want uh, I want to make sure that my i psi bar psi interaction is real. Oh, okay, 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 okay. All right. Um, sorry. Hello. I have a question. Sure. Uh, uh, I have a I have a small uh, confusion. Uh, may I ask? Yes. Uh, so I have the uh, problem regarding flux attachment. I mean, uh, so. Uh, you said uh, uh, boson and fermion like we can relate to uh, relate to each other. So my point is uh, basically operating Lie algebra to graded Lie algebra through super supersymmetry also we can do that thing right. So my point is what is the difference between what you are making uh, like you are saying about flux attachment and the side from um, supersymmetry. So what is the I, difference? I'm, here? So I'm the 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 Lie groups that that govern these things are are all standard Lie groups. They're not supergroups. I haven't, uh, there, there's no supersymmetry in this problem. Uh, right. Uh, so so you're saying like these two uh, are basically equivalent flux attachment and supersymmetry things? No, I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm not. I'm okay, saying so that if you, if you take a non-relativistic, um, non-supersymmetric theory, standard, electrons on, on a plane, attach flux to, to it, the collective behavior of the fermion plus a flux behaves like a boson. Okay. And nothing to do with, uh, with supersymmetry at this point. Right. Yeah, so I was asking that you said that uh, yeah, this is an IR duality, right? So there's no max volume for yeah. uh, uh, either of the two gauge fees. But in the previous slide, I thought that the capital A was non-dynamical and the small A was dynamical. Uh, so I thought that the dynamical field had its own Maxwell term. Or am I understanding it wrongly? Yeah, I'm not understanding your question. Can you say it again? Yeah, so uh, you introduced two kinds of gauge fields here, capital A and small A. Yeah. So, so one of them is dynamical. So I thought by dynamical, you meant that the Maxwell term is there. No, uh, um, by, dynamical, by dynamical, I mean that there will be a little a da, little a wedge d little a. So, so there are two types of there are two types of oh, kinetic okay. terms I can have in two plus one dimension. There are two types of kinetic terms that I can have, right? So, sorry, right. just one second. Uh, just give me a second, please. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Um, so there, there are two types of kinetic terms you can have, right? One is a one is a one will go like okay. Let me let me write this down. Okay. So one is precisely this term here. Right. The the Chern Simons term is a kinetic term for for a gauge field. Okay. 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 Um, but it's not a Maxwell term. The other one is S Maxwell. We'll call it, which will look like. One over e squared. There's probably some factors of pi that I'm missing, but don't really care. Um, and this term will look like this. Uh, okay, so we are doing the basically the second derivative terms essentially. I'm sorry, say that again. We are ignoring second uh, terms which has two derivatives, uh, which has a derivative square essentially, like f minus well, yes. whatever. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Good. All right. So most of you know my understanding from, from of, of these dualities um, stem from from a beautiful set of papers by Burgess and Cavedo and and some of their collaborators over the years, Lutkin, um, uh, Gersero, etc. Um, <clears throat> and and what they did was effectively um, propose an algorithm for how you do uh, a duality. And the, the algorithm goes like this, and this is roughly what I'm going to be talking about. 
But this is going to be like, you know, you try to build a building and you build a scaffold first, you set up a scaffold, and then you build a building. Um, and then when the building is finished, you can throw away the scaffold because the building is there and it stands on its own. So, so I would like you to keep in mind that when I say two theories are dual to each other, um, I'm really going to mean this entire, all of the stuff that you do in this, in this slide. Okay? Um, and, and if you want to check the two theories are dual, technically you need to go through this process um, for, for each duality that you, that you write down. Okay, so the Burgess and Cabello duality algorithm starts from a theory, let's say theory A, um, and what you do is you identify a global symmetry of this theory. Then you gauge the global symmetry of the, of the theory by introducing some dynamical gauge field. Let's call that gauge field little a, okay? So again, theory A has a global symmetry group. You gauge this global symmetry group by introducing a dynamical gauge field as you would when you first learned about the Higgs mechanism and things like that. And then you wanna make sure that you don't add non-trivial degrees of freedom to the theory. So what you do is you constrain A to be pure gauge. And the way you do that is by setting um, the curvature of A, let's say F and little f will denote uh, D little a. You set that equal to zero. So this is a, this is a constraint that you impose on the, on the theory to make sure that you're not adding in new degrees of freedom, okay? And the way you do this is by adding a Lagrange multiplier that forces F to be zero. So the Lagrange multiplier term that you add to your, to your um, uh, action will look like, like this, some lambda F term, and it forces that F equals zero as Lagrange multipliers force constraints. Okay. Um, the resulting action is a functional of phi, your original variable, this gauge field delay, as well as the Lagrange multiplier, right? So that gives you this guy, um, S monster. And the story goes as follows. If you first integrate out um, the Lagrange multiplier and then the gauge field, you'll arrive back at your theory, theory A. That's this guy. On the other hand, if you switch the order of integration and first integrate out the gauge field, little a, followed by the scalar, phi, you will end up with a dual theory for your Lagrange multiplier. Let's call that theory B, okay? When steps one through four are possible, and it's not always true that steps one through four are possible, and there are lots of caveats to, to include here that has to do with Fadia Popov gauge fixing terms and, and things like that. When steps one through four are possible, then we'll say that theory A and theory B are dual to each other. And we'll denote this by the statement that the Lagrangians of A and B are dual to each other. So I wanna be clear here. Whenever I say something like theory A is dual to theory B and I write it like the Lagrangian of A is the same as, uh, is, 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 is dual to the Lagrangian of B, I mean steps one through four. And I mean that you can actually carry out those steps one through four, which is a highly non-trivial task. So are we clear on what I mean by duality in this case? Right, so no questions and I'm gonna assume that I can go. Great. Okay, so let's talk about Bose-Fermi duality then. So this is Bosonization. As I said, Bosonization was well understood. Uh, am I not? Okay, it was clear. My screen seems to be stuck somewhere. Um, are you seeing the same screen, the post Burgess Cavetto duality algorithm? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Let's see. Let's try this again. Uh, I seem to have got disconnected. Sorry, let me, let me try screen sharing again. Apologies for that.
Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, there. Abhinash, can you able to hear me? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, something is, some problem is there in his side, probably. Okay. Uh. I will have his sign again. Hi, can you can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna disconnect it at some point. Let me try sharing again. Okay, it's promising. Ah, good. Excellent. Okay, so, so can everybody see that again? Yes. Great. Okay, so let's talk about Bose Fermi duality then. Um, as I said previously, um, you know, Bosonization is a story that that um, that works in um, uh, that is well defined, well understood in one plus one dimensions. The story in Two plus one dimensions um, also exists and also can be um, defined, and it's really the statement that um, <clears throat> that if I couple um, if I couple a the partition function um, for a fermion, um, so this is what I get when I take s fermion and integrate it over um, over the uh, the fermion, integrate out the fermion in the path integral, and I multiply that by e to the minus i over two um, s churn Simons, then I get um, z scalar plus flux, um, uh, which is a, a function of a. Here, s, uh, sorry, z scalar plus flux is what I get when I take um, s scalar, add to it a churn Simons term, add to it a um, bf term, that's because I'm coupling in an external gauge field, um, capital A, and then integrate out um, the dynamical gauge field A and the, and the scalar phi. So what's left is just a functional of um, the external gauge field. So bosonization is the statement that Z fermion e to the minus i over two um, S uh, Chern Simons is the same as Z scalar plus flux. Okay, and you can see on the right-hand side, I have a boson. On the left-hand side, I have a fermion. All right. So again, um, the the point that I wanted to make, the point that I made earlier, is that um, the Maxwell term. Sorry, there should be a there should be a squared here. The Maxwell term, um, which goes like one over four um, e squared t a squared, goes to zero in the low energy limit. The second point I'd like to make is that um, I can actually use this Bosonization duality to derive another Bosonization duality by acting on this thing with the time reversal operator. So the time reversal operator acts to change the sign of the churn simons term as well as the BF coupling. That's because churn simons terms and BF coupling are um, parity um, uh, non-invariant in in two plus one dimension. This is a well-known um, story. So if I do that, I take this bosonization duality, 
I changed the signs of the Chern Simons term and the, Bos and the um, uh, BF um, coupling, and I'll get a new duality, which reads that Z fermion e to the plus i over two S Chern Simons is dual is, is equal to um, Z. Let's call it Z tilde of a Z tilde scalar plus flux of a. And Z tilde differs from Z in that um, these two signs are, uh, are, are changed. Okay, so now we have actually two dualities. We have bosonization in two plus one dimensions, and we have a time reversal, the time reversed version of bosonization. Okay, good. So it turns out that this bosonization and its time reversed counterpart. Um, are essentially um, <clears throat> are essentially the seed for the for the uh, for the three-dimensional duality web, in the sense that I said that the three-dimensional duality web consists of uh, 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 Fermi Fermi Bose Fermi and Bose Bose um, dualities, and essentially uh, and, and the point is that I can use any one of these dualities to seed all the other dualities. Starting from one, I can derive all the other ones. Um, it's going to be most convenient for us to, to start from the Bose Fermi bosonization, 3D bosonization um, web, um, and then um, derive the others from it. So let's see how we would derive the Fermi Fermi duality, for example. So the Fermi Fermi duality is really a statement of um, Sun's conjecture that the composite fermion is really a Dirac fermion. In words, this is a statement that a massless Dirac fermion coupled to an external gauge field, uh, external abelian gauge field, is dual to a composite fermion um, coupled to um, an external gauge, an external gauge field, and a U1 dynamical gauge field uh, little a. Right. At the level of um, equations, this is the statement that Z fermion um, of a is equal to um, the partition function for 3D QED, so quantum electrodynamics in three dimensions which is what I get if I take S fermion, um, add in a BF coupling, and then integrate out the fermion and the, the dynamical gauge field. Okay. Uh, um, are the qualities independent of the gauge fixing conditions of, uh, on, of, on the gauge fields? Whatever gauge fixing conditions we impose on the gauge fields on either side? Oh, I'm sorry, say that again? On either side? Um, yes. Yes, it is. So, so I can take whichever, uh, I mean, on both sides, I choose whatever gauge fixing condition I want and the uh, duality still holds. As long as you're consistent on both sides, yes, it, it, it will hold. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, so, so this is the Fermi Fermi duality that was that was uh, derived by, uh, but well, that was conjectured by some, and that was um, elaborated on by Vishwanath and, and, and uh, Medlitsky. But now what we can do is we can actually derive this from the 3D bosonization of the previous slide. And we do this by following the following um, steps. They're quite simple steps and they're quite simple to state. So I'm gonna do it once in some detail now, and then I'm going to, um, I'm going to say that we're gonna do the same thing for all the other dualities that we follow. It starts from the bosonization duality that we already started with. Okay. Remember, it was a statement about the equality of partition functions as functionals of the external gauge field A. So it was Z of A and Z of A. So the story is the following. What you do is you start from that, you promote um, little a to a dynamical gauge field. Let's call it, sorry, you promote capital A to a dynamical gauge field, we'll call it little a. And we couple in a new external gauge field, which because of reasons for, of, of the, uh, consistency with the literature, I'm gonna call capital A. Um, it's a little bit confusing. So I start off with capital A, send capital A to little a, and then add in a new capital A, okay? On the left-hand side, what happens is, um, from, from our bosonization duality, on the left-hand side, what happens is um, I get um, the partition function for uh, QED3 coupled to an external gauge field. On the right-hand side, I get this partition function um, for uh, Z of A 
um, scalar plus flux. Okay. Um, now, you'll notice that now I have this um, external gauge field, and because, uh, sorry, now I have this dynamical gauge field, and because of the dynamical gauge field, I have to integrate out over the, the, the gauge field, and I'm integrating out over phi as well. Um, and this A tilde here was the original dynamical gauge field that I had in, in sitting in the path integral. So all my action pieces are going to consist of the scalar action, the Chen Simons action for A tilde, um, the Chen Simons action for A, and a BS coupling between A and capital A, the external gauge field. Now, this little a occurs quadratically in the, in the actions, which means that I can integrate out over, that I can carry out the path integral by essentially using the equations of motion for a. Um, so the equation of motion for a is that dA is minus d capital A plus two dA tilde. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think uh, the screen has frozen. Or is it just for me? Um, hold on, it's... Anything appear? No, 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 no I could... screen is okay, perfectly it's okay. Maybe there is some problem oh, okay. with the yeah, I can see it, it's... Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Yes, it seems to be working for me, so, sorry. It doesn't work for me too, so, I don't know. It doesn't work for you either? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, strange, maybe it's... Uh... So, but, Santan, can yeah, you, can yeah, you yeah. see me doing I that? I can see and I can see the cursor, everything is working. Anyone else having problems seeing the screen? Uh, I can see the screen, but uh, like I don't see any changes. Like, uh, can you just uh, maybe move the move something? You, you can't see what? Sorry? I can't see any change. Like, can you just uh, highlight something? I would understand whether it's stuck or not. Can you see what I just did there? Highlight, highlight. Uh, okay, no, no, no. I'm going to highlight the word integrate. Yeah. Yeah, and now I can see. Uh, uh, I no, just maybe I have to uh, log back in or something. Uh, yeah. No, no, it's uh, regarding the internet connection, nothing else. I think if from your side it is now okay. You can move on. Okay, so, okay. so let me move on um, and hopefully it'll, it'll catch up again. Um, uh, okay, so, so. The equation of motion is that d little a is minus d capital A plus 2 d a tilde, um, which as long as there's no non-trivial holonomy issues going, around, going on, um, uh, is the statement that um, little a is minus capital A plus 2 a tilde. Okay, so I then substitute back into the, into the right-hand side and I will find that the right-hand side is e to the minus i over two s Chen Simons times a path integral over phi over a tilde and uh, weighted by the scalar action minus i times the Chen Simons action minus i times the BF action between a tilde and a. Which if you go back to what I said about um, the bosonization um, duality is just um, e to the plus, sorry, I should use a different color, um, e to the plus i over 2 s Chen Simons times uh, z fermion. And the two exponentials cancel out, and the right-hand side is precisely um, z fermion. In other words, I end up with a statement that, um, that z fermion and z QED are equal to each other, which means that um, the two theories are dual to each other by our previous agreement, right? So in this way, we've derived, in some sense, the Fermi-Fermi duality um, of uh, Vishwanath and uh, Mitlevsky. Similarly, I can play the same game with um, Bose-Bose duality. Um, and I can re-derive in some sense the particle vortex um, duality. Here, I start off with bosonization, um, but I divide both sides by uh, e to the i s Chern Simons. So I get the bosonization duality in the following form. So it says that z uh, fermion plus flux um, times e to the minus i s Chern Simons. 
is a Z scalar. Um, and here I'm calling the external field C. Then I promote C to A, um, some dynamical field, and I couple in a new external gauge field, which I'm going to call capital A. So with this, the left-hand side becomes um, Z scalar plus flux. And the right-hand side, by the same game of, inter of integrating out um, uh, the, the dynamical gauge field, becomes essentially um, Z tilde fermion plus flux times e to the i um, s chan Simons. <clears throat> In other words, what we've derived here is that if I apply um, if I apply bosonization twice, I find that the partition function for the scalar theory is dual, sorry, is, is equal to the partition function for um, the scalar uh, QED theory. So essentially what I'm saying here is that um, I've derived the, um, the uh, particle vortex duality, the bosonic particle vortex duality or boson-boson um, duality. Now, there's a couple of points to, to note here. One is that the scalar could be either at the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, in which case um, I would say that the duality maps a Wilson-Fisher um, scalar to a gauged Wilson-Fisher scalar, or it could be at the free field fixed point. And applying bosonization twice doesn't, doesn't disambiguate between those two. Now, a key point in, in this derivation, both derivations, in fact, is that the integration um, in, sorry, sorry, is that the integration of the equation of motion involved no holonomies in the gauge field. Um, if, however, my theory is at finite temperature and I'm, and I'm doing the bosonization, I'm doing the duality on a thermal circle, then I will have non-trivial holonomies to consider um, and uh, I should be more careful. This is a, this is a non-trivial problem to consider and, and one that, that, I'm, that I'm currently studying with one of my students. Um, by playing essentially the same game, starting off from one of these dualities, bosonization, Fermi-Fermi, Bose-Bose, um, promoting the external gauge field um, to a dynamical gauge field and integrating out over the dynamical gauge field, I can generate many, many more dualities, okay? So for example, um, I can apply this to, to show that uh, QED3 with two flavors is a self-dual theory. Or I could show that a scalar plus some level two churn Simons gauge field, a scalar coupled to a level two churn Simons gauge field is dual to a fermion coupled to a level three halves um, churn Simons gauge field. Or I can couple this whole thing to 3D gravity and, and, and play the same story with 3D gravity. Again, another problem that I'm studying with my students. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot um, that can be done, essentially starting off with a 3D duality web. And, and, and one of the reasons why we call it a 3D duality web and one of the reasons why um, it's, it's, it's generating so much interest. Okay, so that's the story in three dimensions. The philosophy is there. Uh, what I mean by duality is there, what I mean by the web is there, how to traverse between different um, theories in the web is, is, is all there. So now let's see what will happen in, in um, four dimensions. To understand the four dimensional construction, we need to understand something about the equivalent of um, the Chern-Simons terms um, uh, in three dimensions. So the thing that's gonna play the role of the, the Chern-Simons term in, in, in four dimensions um, is going to be theta terms. So let me say a little bit about theta terms in electrodynamics. The story is, is quite simple here. If I demand that I have a theory that is linear in the fields at the level of the equation of the motion, um, Lorentz invariant and gauge invariant, then I'm led almost uniquely to Maxwell electrodynamics. In other words, I will have, a, I will have a, 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 an action like this, that is quadratic in the electric and magnetic fields. And such that if I take the functional derivative of, of this um, uh, action with respect to uh, the, the, the gauge field, A mu, um, and set it equal to zero, I'm led to the Maxwell equations. Okay. My caveat here is that this is almost uniquely the case. In four dimensions, um, well, four dimensions is special because a two form, 
like the field strength tensor in the Maxwell um, action is Hodge dual to another two form. And that's because four minus two is two. But what this means is that we can define a dual two form star f mu nu, and star f mu nu is, is related to um, f through this relation here where epsilon mu nu lambda sigma is, um, is the completely anti-symmetric tensor in four dimensions. And the effect here is that this guy, um, f mu nu, star f mu nu, has the same electric and magnetic fields of the original theory, but arranged in different parts of the tensor. And in particular, to get from the original theory to this theory, all I have to do is exchange the electric and magnetic fields with the magnetic and minus the electric fields. But that's exactly what we said was electric magnetic duality. Okay. The theta term that I talked about is a term that I can add to the Maxwell action that looks like this. S theta is this morass of constants here, theta e squared divided by four pi, um, H, uh, four pi squared h bar times a term that's proportional to star f mu nu, f mu nu, right? If I express this in, 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 in the components of f, it's a term that's proportional to E dot B. It's still quadratic in the electric and magnetic fields, but in the form E dot B. So it's on a scalar, it's all good, um, but it's this E dot B term. Now, um, this theta here comes with all of these other constants because I require that theta is a dimensionless parameter in the theory. Okay. Great, so let's see what the implications of this is. At first hand, you would look at this thing and you'd say, this is dynamically trivial. Why is it dynamically trivial? Well, because I can express it as a total derivative, right? So I can express this theta term as a total derivative like this. And total derivatives are boundary terms and boundary terms don't contribute to dynamics. <clears throat> However, this theta term, it turns out, is quite crucial in some actual physical problems. One such problem is the problem of axions in which theta becomes a dynamic, is promoted to a dynamical variable. So not just a parameter, theta is a function of your space-time coordinates. Um, and this leads to a contribution to the electrodynamics that looks like this, where theta has actual dynamics. Now this means that when you do a variation of the action to get the equations of motion and you're integrating by parts, you have to account for theta being dynamical, which gives you additional source terms to your action, uh, sorry, to your equations of motion. And this is called axion electrodynamics. Okay? There's a whole cottage industry of, 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 of uh, physics problems considering axion electrodynamics in the early universe, et cetera, et cetera. So it plays interesting, important roles in cosmology, for example. Another point of interest is in the topological insulators that I mentioned earlier. So a topological insulator, as I said, is a novel type of quantum matter. And it turns out that this novel type of quantum matter is characterized precisely by theta taking the value of pi in the topological um, quantum matter in the topological insulator. And this should be contrasted with theta equals zero in the vacuum. And the fact that theta equals pi and theta equals zero in the insulator and the vacuum respectively gives you a boundary between these two, um, between these two objects. And it is precisely the existence of this boundary which leads to um, uh, uh, the ability of electrons to move on the surface or the interface of the, of the insulator. So there's some really deep, interesting, important physics in this theta term. And it's not just a term you can throw away by saying, oh, well, this is a boundary term and it doesn't give me any dynamics. So our approach to deriving a full 4D duality web, and I'll tell you what I mean by full 4D duality web, builds on the 3D web using the same Burgess and Cavello um, duality algorithm um, and in that paper, or in a, in a follow-up paper, they use that duality algorithm to show how to derive bosonization in higher dimensions. So we're going to use the 4D uh, bosonization as a seed um, to seed a four-dimensional um, duality web. 
So bosonization can be um, lifted to four dimensions. What about particle vortex duality? So what about the, the boson boson duality? Well, this is a little bit more subtle, but it can be done. And the observation is as follows. <clears throat> In three dimensions, particles and vortices are dual since essentially vortices behave like particles. And vortices behave like particles because scalars are dual in a geometric language to one forms. By this, I mean that if I start off with a scalar, its um, associated curvature, d phi, which is a one form, which I'm going to call f1, is Hodge dual in three dimensions to a two form. That's because uh, three minus one is two. And that two form is the field strength for a one form um, uh, object, A1. So in that sense, I will say that this uh, scalar is dual to a one form. So what is that one form? Well, that one form is precisely um, what you would couple the world line of a particle to um, in an integral like this. So, um, vortices and particles are dual to each other in this way. That's in three dimensions. So what about four dimensions? Well, in four dimensions, a scalar is dual in the same way to a two form because phi um, has a curvature d phi, which is a one form, which is Hodge dual to a, uh, to a four minus one is a three um, form, which is the field strength for a two form, um, uh, for, for a two form. And then you have to ask, well, what is this two form source? Well, two forms source by a similar type of um, uh, term. Um, two forms source, two forms coupled to two chains. And the kind of two chain that we're talking about is the surface of a, of a, world, uh, of a world sheet. And the world sheet is generated by the motion in, spa in space time of a one dimensional object, which is the strength. In other words, I would expect in four dimensions, not a particle vortex duality, but a vortex string duality. And this vortex string duality was, was certainly uh, recognized and, um, and studied um, and used to motivate lifting the two plus one dimensional particle vortex duality to three plus one dimensions. Um, and there, the lift would be to a vortex boson duality by condensing um, nielsen olsen strings. And this was studied by Beekman and Darius Sadri and, and, and Jan Zanen. But we chose to, to go a slightly different route. Um, and our route follows the recent work of Palumbo, who conjectured a three plus one dimensional version of the Fermi Fermi duality. Right? And there's, there's a couple of different um, ways of thinking about this. So one way is to focus on the, uh, on the, the work of Zanon et al. and start from the vortex boson duality. Another way is to start from this Palumbo duality, the Fermi Fermi duality. And then a, a third way is to start with the three dimensional duality web and then layer the, 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 the planes on top of each other um, and take the, the limit in which the, the density of, of planes goes to infinity, and then you end up with a three plus one dimensional bulk material. Okay, so there are different people that are considering different um, uh, avenues to a four dimensional duality web. We're going to follow. Um, we're going to take inspiration from from this work, the Fermi Fermi duality. And I'm going to show you how this works now. Um, before deriving um, the, the four-dimensional web. So we want a couple of things. One, one is we want a full 4D web that reduces to the 3D web. Um, and so I'm going to, to first start off by reviewing this uh, construction of Palumbo of the um, 4D Fermi Fermi duality. And, and, and essentially the story goes like this. You start off with a massive direct fermion coupled to a U1 gauge field. This is a U1 external gauge field, so there's no dynamics. Let's say that this action um, is S1. S1 is a functional of psi, um, the massive Dirac fermion, and the external gauge field A. Um, I give the mass, I give the, the, the fermion some mass. All right, this mass allows me to integrate out the fermion, and I'll get an effective field theory for, um, for A. 
that effective field theory takes the form um, precisely this theta term form um, of epsilon f f. On the other hand, if I start from a composite fermion and I couple the composite fermion to a u1 gauge field, um, <clears throat> let's call it uh, little a and two form um, b mu nu, and I'm going to assume that both of those have dynamics and so neither of them is an external gauge field, so that my action looks like this, S2, which is a functional of um, psi, the composite fermion, little a, capital A, which is an external gauge field, and a two-form B. Then I'll have the standard action for psi um, uh, from the, the mass term. This is the kinetic term for the B. So it's it goes like H mu nu, which is, um, so H is dB. So it goes like H squared. So is, it, is it like Carbramon term? Yeah, hmm. correct. So the Carbramon term is a, is a, is a source, to, is, a, is an action for, for precisely a B mu nu, the Carbramon field, All right? And then I'll have some, some BF type coupling that couples uh, B to F and B to little F. Um, which, which are the field strengths for capital A and little a respectively. Again, because my fermion is massive, I can integrate it out. And when I integrate it out, I'll get this effective field, which will have an FF type coupling, BF type coupling, and this H squared um, term. The low energy limit of this theory is precisely what you do when you, is precisely what you, what you um, get when you take chi to infinity, in the same way that you set E to infinity in, in the 3D problem. In which case, this two-form field acts as a Lagrange multiplier, which enforces um, vanishing of this term here. In other words, little f and capital F are the negatives of each other. And ultimately, what you get is that S1 and S2 effective, the effective field theories for S1 and S2 are the same. And so we use this to say that S1 and S2 are dual to each other. So that's Polymbo's duality. And it turns out that you can do more than this. You can, in fact, reduce this duality at the boundary. So at the boundary of the four-dimensional manifold, um, this S1 effective basically just becomes the chern simons term in three dimensions. And S2 effective becomes a chern simons BF term in three dimensions, right? But the chern simons term is nothing but an effective field theory for a 3D Dirac fermion coupled to a U1 gauge field. And this S chern simons BF is nothing but the effective action for a composite Dirac fermion also coupled to a U1 A with some BF terms that couple into an external gauge field. And so you can show how this four-dimensional Fermi-Fermi duality reduces to the three-dimensional Fermi-Fermi duality. But, and this is the important thing, these BF couplings, while they're correct, they're not what Sun conjectured. So this is the correct dimensional reduction of, of the four-dimensional Fermi-Fermi duality, but it is not Sun's conjecture. So we wanted to, we wanted to derive Sun's conjecture. So we started instead not from the Fermi-Fermi duality or the or the Bose Bose duality from, from 4D Bosonization. And we followed um, essentially Burgess and Lutkin and, and Quevedo. So we start from a massive Dirac fermion coupled to an external gauge field. You then gauge the global U1 of the, of the fermion to get a master action. And then you integrate out the dynamical fields psi and A um, to get an effective bosonic theory, this guy here. Okay, and and this comes to to um, to your question. Uh, how do I pronounce your name, Agniva? Yeah, Agniva. Okay, great. So this comes to your question with the mass. Why is the mass there? Well, it turns out that in the large mass limit, the functional integral um, is is dominated by operators with the lowest uh, lowest uh, mass dimension. So you can actually write down an effective um, um, field theory, and you can carry out the path integral. 
<clears throat> this results in a vacuum polarization, let's call it pi mu nu. And you can invert this vacuum polarization to get precisely this kind of one over boxed um, term, which leads to a bosonic um, interaction. So this leads to precisely a bosonic um, action with this kind of um, non-local term. And this is the this is the the four dimensional bosonization. Okay. So to construct a four D bosonic um, for, to construct a four D duality web, what we need is a time reversed version of this bosonization. Um, so you know you can play the same game that we that I said you can play in in um, three dimensions. Um, and then from it, you can construct a 40-40, uh, sorry, 40 Fermi Fermi duality. So you can start with a 40 bosonization, again, promote the external gauge field to some fluctuating field, which I'll call A mu um, bar. You add in um, terms um, like F squared, F, uh, F bar squared, F bar G, um, uh, epsilon F bar G and epsilon F squared. And you can fix the, const uh, the, the constants by requiring that you get the correct F squared plus FG contributions. And then you can integrate out the fluctuating field A bar. And the result will be um, the 4D equivalent of um, Sans conjecture, which is a complicated expression that looks like this. But, is it, but it essentially dimensionally reduces to precisely um, the 3D Fermi Fermi uh, duality. And you can follow the similar strategy with two applications of the 4D bosonization, and you can derive a 40, 40 boson boson um, duality, which again reduces to the 3D um, boson boson um, duality. <clears throat> and so doing, derive then a four dimensional version of the three dimensional duality web. So to finish, um, this talk, I want to end by just um, pointing out some outstanding issues. The first of which is that the 3D web holds in the infrared, and the 4D web similarly holds in the infrared. But in deriving the theory, not only did I need to take chi to infinity, which is the um, what Santan correctly um, uh, pointed out was a was a Calbermon coupling. Not only did I need to send chi to infinity and e to infinity um, for the Maxwell terms for the dynamical gauge fields. But there was this term here, which I haven't really mentioned. Um, it's this beta that comes from the terms that I, that I added and that I needed to get to, to fix. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that in order to derive the duality, I have to take a, a, a slightly singular limit of this uh, beta going to um, uh, infinity. So this is an open problem. How to understand the limits of the validity of the various um, limits that I need, how to understand the validity of the various limits that, that I've taken um, and whether they can commute or not. The second point is that the three-dimensional duality web can be derived, as I argued earlier, from three-dimensional mirror symmetry. So the map between the free chiral superfield and n equals two super QED. Well, it turns out that the two plus one dimensional superspace for the supersymmetric QED descends by dimensional reduction from an n equal one three plus one dimensional superspace. So I should expect that there's some relation between three plus one dimensional supersymmetric field theory and the two plus one dimensional um, uh, field theory that I, that I use in mirror symmetry. But of course, um, but of course, uh, <coughs> four dimensional supersymmetric dualities are, 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 are much better understood than even three dimensional version. This is of course Seiberg duality. And so one would ask, is there a similar understanding or derivation of the four dimensional duality web that can be arrived at from four dimensional cyborg duality? And if so, what is it? And then finally, part of the big interest in this work in duality webs um, had to do with 
um, the fact that the three-dimensional duality web can be used to predict novel exotic gapped phases of matter. Um, now, of course, we've got a four-dimensional duality web, and there we can apply this to, to three plus one dimensional um, quantum matter. And so the question arises, um, can the four-dimensional web, or maybe some non-abelian extension of the four-dimensional web, be used to predict novel exotic gapped phases of quantum matter in four dimensions, like the three plus one dimensional topological insulator. Thank you. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for the talk. Uh, I would ask uh, the attendees, please unmute and give a clap for me for giving such a nice talk. And you can ask very short question because he probably have to give another talk. So I don't want, I can't be able to involve him for long. So you can ask very short question uh, if you have really. Well, no questions from my end. <laughs> I've asked quite a few. Thanks a lot. Okay, Jeff, then I, I, I would have to say that thank you for giving this contribution. And uh, this will be posted in YouTube in my channel. So I will share the link with you once this is cool. done. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we, we usually chat some frequently. So we talk to each Good. other and stay safe and healthy. That's important. Thank you. You too. And everybody else in the room. Thanks very much. Yeah. See you. Thank Bye. you. Yeah. Bye-bye.